Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, again, uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Andre, and I will be hosting this uh, second session. Um, and now as we prepare to begin, please be aware that this presentation will be recorded and possibly shared online. Um, as such, if you do not wish your image to appear in the recording, please turn off your cameras now. Um, you might also want to change the name that appears in your camera window. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat area, um, which will be monitored by me, the room coordinator. Um, and of course, everyone, if you could uh, mute yourselves um, so that we can hear Tom clearly. Okay, so um, we're now going to begin. So we have Tom, and of course, he's gonna be talking about contradictory information and gray rear levels, which do we believe? Okay, Tom, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm glad that you um, have decided to attend my presentation. There isn't too much that's new here except a comparison of these various leveling systems and some suggestions as it um, shows in my abstract, um, some recommendations to, uh, for what to do about it. So um, I found this, um, it, it's an eight-year-old study at Jisun University um, about what they were trying to do when they were arranging their books. And they said they put seals on each reader to indi indicate the head word level, and they kept records of the number of pages in each reader. And the problem was that when they bought more readers, it soon became evident that neither of these factors were very useful for their student, for the record keeping or for their students. They did arrange them like this into six levels, which probably isn't uh, enough because especially uh, the yellow and the red levels have quite a distribution of different headword counts, which means it's difficult for the levels. So a student could go to what uh, he or she thinks is the correct level and end up with something which is uh, too difficult. So um, here are the various measures of book difficulty. If I've forgotten one, please let me know. Of course, there's a number of headwords and then there's the publisher's uh, start, uh, stated level. This is a starter book, it's an intermediate book and so forth. There's a, what I pronounce as suffer, I'm not sure how other people do, a common European framework of reference which uh, is, Publishers uh, label their books from pre-A1 up to C2. Well, there are very few C2, actually, because uh, those people don't really need graded readers so much anymore, even though publishers make them sometimes. Uh, the percent of words probably understood by the student, of course, it, they're supposed to understand 98% of the words in the book for it to be uh, readable without them having to resort to a dictionary uh, too frequently. Uh, the length of the book, a longer book tends to be more difficult. The Yomiyasusa level, which is a scale of, um, well, it actually has 100 points on the scale. Um, and this is the only one which is actually humanly judged because teachers actually uh, rated them, uh, the books, and then it was the average of the ratings. Um, my own M reader scale, which goes from zero to nine. It used to go from one to 10, but we realized that one was not low enough, so we had to make a zero uh, as well. The Lexile uh, values, and this is not used for extensive reading because it turns out it doesn't work very well, and, uh, and the graded readers actually don't have Lexile um, values anyway, but I'll be talking about that later. Uh, the Flesch-Kincaid scale, which um, is equivalent to American grade levels, basically, but it works with native speakers, just like the Lexile one does, but not with uh, our learners. So uh, concerning the Yomiyasusa levels, uh, Yomiyasusa, for those who don't know Japanese, just means ease of reading. And this book here was uh, published by Akio uh, Furukawa, and there's a sample page there. And even though it's uh, in Japanese, uh, it's manageable even for those who can't read Japanese. And um, he also has online this um, uh, tables, which is updated. You can see this was updated in June. And so for every series that he has, which is more serious than almost anyone else has, uh, he has a list of the books with their current, uh, with the Yomiyasasa 
values. And this, I'm at the end, I'm basically going to say is probably the most accurate way uh, for learning the actual difficulty level of books. Uh, now, one problem with the uh, Yomiyasa level and the Lexi levels and some other, it's a continuous scale, which means how do you arrange the books in the library? You aren't going to arrange them from 0 0.1 and then 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. You'd have um, 100 different sections in your shelving. So you have to have some way to make them into uh, meaningful subsections. So the continuum needs to be needs to be segmented into a suitable number of sections to afford efficient arrangement in libraries. And if there are too few sections, then within one section there's too much variation, like the uh, GSEN um, study that I showed you earlier. If there are too many, then within one section there's insufficient choice uh, and there's not much variety. So, of course, uh, it depends also on how many books you have in your library. The more books you actually have available to the students, perhaps the finer you can make your segmentation. But once you do it, it's hard to change it because librarians hate to have to relabel books. So um, this is actually part of what I did for the um, ER MOOC, which is now in its beta version, um, explaining how it's possible to judge the value of a book. So on the back of a book, I've chosen one from uh, Pearson here. This is at uh, 1700 Headwords, which also it says is, wait a minute, I think I have, yeah, I do. Um, it's on the separate scale, it's at the B1 level, and there's the Headwords, and it has how many words it is. So most books, um, graded readers, have this information on the back. Now, if you go to youth readers, ones that are not graded but are commonly used for extensive reading, this information is not available and that's problematic. Um, so there are various headword sets that the publishers make. So if it's a 1700 headword set, they have looked at the corpus and decided what words should be in those 1700 words and then they make this list they don't show it to us but supposedly they show it to the authors and the list can be adjusted it doesn't have to be the 1700 most common words in english according to whatever corpus they're using because they can look at it and say there are words in there that um, will never be needed and there may be other words which would be commonly used so they adjust it to what they think is suitable for the series that they are planning and the authors are given an, an allowance of a few extra words uh, that are required to tell the story, uh, but these are usually gloss or sometimes used in a sentence, so they're self-defining. Uh, for example, and this is from Sue Leather, Louis threw out the vegetables on the hot walk, the large Chinese pan he used for cooking all his dishes. So hmm, I think that's uh, from one of Rob's series, right? That's the uh, page turner series. And this also, speaking of Rob Waring, um, this is the extensive reading guide, which Rob uh, devised quite a few years ago, where he grouped things by levels of headwords. Uh, well, it depends on how many are there, from 50 to 200 in each unit, and further up 300 and so on. And he said at that time, and he's absolutely right, this is the only objective measure that we have from publishers is the number of announced headwords. Um, but it's problematic because in one uh, section, for example, elementary early, you will find that the number of headwords uh, may be the same, but the actual difficulty can be quite different. Diff yeah, okay. So. Unfortunately for us, each publisher maintains its own list of headwords uh, from separate uh, corpora, and there's considerable variation. So, and also, some publishers are very strict concerning the headword count, but others allow the authors to write according to their own feel what is what appropriate, and then maybe later do some little adjustment if it turns out they've used too much vocabulary. So anyway, there is quite a bit of um, variation and how strictly they use both the list of headwords as well as the uh, grammatical corpus. Um, so not just vocabulary, but there are differences in permitted grammatical structures for each level as well. 
Um, and then there are other characteristics which aren't measured by the headwords, such as the number and quality of the illustrations, glossing of words outside the approved headwords, average length of sentences, uh, absence of activities. But these are useful for intense reading, but they get in the way for extensive reading. Uh, multiple titles in series. Uh, if students read books that are in the same series, they tend to have the same vocabulary and same syntax and the same characters. And so they become easier regardless of what the uh, difficulty level has been set at. The total word length, uh, the student interest in the topic and their available background knowledge, the more they know about it, the easier it is. So very often they can read a more difficult book if they're keen, really keen on that topic. Um, and then this is just to show you a comparison of four books. They're all The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Um, they're at various levels, low levels. Uh, they have different numbers of words. They have different number of head words. Um, they have different ratings on the Sefer scale. And the Yomiyasasa levels are different. And also on M Reader, uh, the Kyoto reading scale, um, they're at different levels from two to five. So here, the, the green is uh, the lowest and the orange is the highest with anything in between being ignored. So here, um, the Pearson one is the lowest in words and the Macmillan one is the highest in head words. Uh, the Black Cat one is the highest. And for Sefer, again, the Black Cat one is the highest, but uh, both the Macmillan and the Pearson one are at the same uh, Sefer level. And then for Yomi Asasa, um, the Oxford Book ones ends up being the most uh, difficult one. And for M Reader, it's um, the Black Cat one. So anyway, it depends which of these systems you look at, which you find is the most uh, difficult. It's pretty obvious from all of these that uh, the Pearson uh, one is the easiest though. And here's another way of viewing it. So here across the top, we have the announced headwords of the various publishers. And down the left side, we have um, some of the various series. Uh, the second one, Penguin there, is the Random House, the new series, which is just coming out. They only have maybe 30 uh, different books out right now. And then the, um, the different colors there show the um, suffer levels. So you can see that the, if you look at the green, it's all over the place. What they say is the suffer level, depending on what the headwords are. So um, you would like to see straight vertical bars of color from each publisher, but that ain't what you get at all. And one thing that's important about this is if you look, there are huge gaps between the levels. And there's not much that um, a publisher can do about that because they only want to publish books at discrete, several discrete levels. They aren't going to publish at each headword level. But the uh, point is that you really do need to supplement one publisher series with at least one others to fill in some of these gaps if you want to have a smooth continuum from easy to difficult. So here, this shows all the ones that are labeled as level one in the various publishers. So you can't do what I've seen some articles do, especially ones uh, early on that say, we use level one books for our study. And it really isn't very meaningful. You have to say, if it's all the Pearson level one books, then there's some uniformity. So within any publisher, there's uniformity. But when you go between publishers, then you have difficulty. Uh, hmm, there was something else here at the bottom that didn't uh, display, but that's all right. Um, and now this is the uh, M-Reader uh, scale, which we use, which has 10 discrete levels. And these are only approximate, but there's a TOEIC, TOEFL, and the Sefer rating uh, for each of them. And you can see here, um, what I was mentioning about the Lexile system, we can't even say that, say, it's 100 to 200 for level one and 200 to 300 for level two, because there's so much 
overlap. Uh, so if you have a book which is at Lexel 275, which level do you assign it to? It actually fits all three of those levels. And the same for if it's Lexile uh, 480, it fits into uh, four different levels. So this is only an issue if you're using non-graded readers because uh, the books that are available abroad for native speaking children usually do have a Lexile rating and it's used in the schools for rating uh, the books and deciding uh, a student's reading level and apparently works reasonably well. I haven't seen too many complaints about it, but there are complaints for people who try to use it for uh, second language learners. And um, here is a questionnaire um, that we ask students to complete af after they finish every quiz. And you can see we have five different questions. And um, so we have ratings that we can look at to see how one book uh, stands, uh, in, uh, how, how difficult a book is compared to other books with the same title or other books in the same series. And the, you can see that for the um, Q1 here, which is uh, how did you like this book, they're pretty much the same. And we found that this isn't all that reliable. But what is strange is question five, how much could you forget that you were studying and just enjoy the book, uh, shows much more variation. This is um, how much they could just simply um, be unconsciously enjoy the book. Um, and there is quite a bit of variation. And since we do have quite a large number of responses for any one of these books, we have something like 19 million uh, responses to our uh, questions now. This di uh, difference may be small, but it is somewhat significant, although I'm not sure what it really means in uh, real life. There are other factors that you need to decide. Um, now, concerning the Lexile levels. Um, now, this is actually, here it says, the text complexity of what one publisher labels as A1 is just as difficult as what another publisher labels as C1. And could someone please mute their mic, whoever has the dog barking in the background? Um, now, this uh, table and this statement were actually written by the president of the uh, Lexile uh, company. And so they agree that it just doesn't work for graded readers. So, oh, I forgot to show you. So here, the one is at uh, A1 and another publisher has a book um, at uh, C1 and they're both uh, 630 or 650 on the Lexile scale. So it just doesn't work for graded reading. So what are we supposed to do about this? Well, one thing, the easiest way when you have a student who has to go select a book, regardless of what you've told them what the level is, is to you tell them to use something like the five finger rule, which basically means open the book to some random pages and look and see how many difficult words there are on that uh, page. This for the individual student will work. It's not going to work for other aspects of extensive reading management, but when a student is choosing a book, it would be good to just tell them to look at the actual words on the page. Just don't pick something because it says it's at their own level. So as I said, you need to have, according to uh, Paul Nation and company in New Zealand, 98% of the words of the text should already be known. Now, in 2017, um, Holster, Lake, and Bellow uh, did a study for uh, Kakenhi, a ministry uh, grant using a rash analysis. And they had some misunderstandings about M-reader functionality, but they were trying to find what is the best way to measure reading difficulty. And they said that uh, Kyoto Scale's reliance on publishers' headword levels raises concerns. Two graded readers of the same headword level from the same publisher may be substantively, substantively different in difficulty, but still be assigned to the same level on the Kyoto Scale. And they're assigned the same uh, headword count and the same uh, everything else too. So 
it's that's why I say you can't just look at the headword count or any specific measure. The students really need to look at the book for him or herself and see if they think it's useful. And of course, we always say for extensive reading that if you start a book and it's too difficult, put it down and grab another one. You don't have to finish them. Although, of course, if you're um, rating them or evaluating them and how many words are read, they're going to say, well, now I've lost half the words of this book because it's not going to count. So there's that issue as well. So anyway, their conclusion was that the Yomiyasasa levels provided the best estimates of perceived book difficulty with 68% of the variance explained, followed by the raw word count with 61%. Well, of course, the raw word count is going to correlate well with difficulty because uh, easy books have very few words and bigger books, uh, more difficult books have a lot of words. So that is going to correlate. And they got 68% variants, but they don't explain exactly how they did this. As they showed in their table, which I don't have on the display here, that M Reader actually was down around 30% variance. But if you, if they had kicked out, say, uh, Yomiyasasa from the statistical mem uh, measurement, then the M Reader one would have gone up. Although I admit that the M Reader one is not going to be as accurate as Yomiyasasa, simply because it's a 10 uh, point scale, not a hundred point scale. So the rating is much coarser. But even the Yomiyasasa one doesn't adjust the uh, levels. Once they are set, they are set. And the Yomiyasasa ones originally, as I said, were done by teachers evaluating books. But recently, I haven't asked uh, Akio this uh, directly, but I believe most of the current ratings are just extrapolated from what they already know about the system. They, because, for example, he has um, values now for the new Pierce, uh, Penguin uh, Random House books, yet I, uh, there hasn't been any time to distribute those books to teachers and get feedback on them. But based on the criteria that he already um, has a, a hold of, he can make a good judgment about what the Yomi Yasuso level is. So it's similar to the M Reader in that uh, sense, except that it's a broader scale. So um, one thing that might be possible is to make a Lexile type rating system for extensive reading, uh, something maybe called ERLex, with some parameters for Lexile measurements such as word length or sentence, uh, sentence length would not be so useful because for graded readers, almost all the books, even at the higher levels, use fairly uh, simple uh, syntax. So there wouldn't be the complex sentences that you would get in native speaker books. Many books used in extensive reading are not graded readers, uh, so their uh, Lexile assignments in, for native speakers would not be relevant. So if we were making an ER Lex system, we would somehow have to reevaluate all of the native speaker books that are also being used um, so that they could be in the same system. And creating values for all the graded readers we already have would mean we would have to get from all the publishers digital versions of their books and then throw them into whatever algorithm we have to calculate the levels. And other factors beyond reading dif uh, difficulty are also important, such as intrinsic interest in the story, background knowledge, and so forth. And then, as I said, a, a system of continuous values makes library shelving and maintenance of individual student uh, level uh, data rather difficult. So my summary from all of this, I haven't checked how long I've been talking, but this is the last slide. The Yomiyasasa system is probably the most accurate to date. Uh, it, however, is not suitable for library shelving purposes unless uh, it's somehow segment, uh, segmented. Um, the Lexile system does not work for EFL, but a similar system based on other criteria might be possible, but, ha but perhaps not so useful. And one publisher series will leave major gaps in the progression of readability. So it must be supplemented with one or more uh, publishers if you want to have a smooth continuum of difficulty um, in your books that you offer your students in your library. And um, you need to encourage students to check the number of unknown words before borrowing the book to ascertain that it really is suitable for them. And I only have uh, two references here. And, um, and you can get this entire PowerPoint 
at that URL there, uh, which is easy, I think, for you to uh, remember. It'll be in the recording of this uh, uh, presentation anyway. And that's all I had. All right, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have a couple of questions um, from Glenn, actually. And one, um, one actually you kind of already answered a bit. Um, how do publishers determine their levels? Um, you, met, you did mention that they have their own uh, corpus. Um, would you know what those corpora would be based on? Every publisher um, has a different way of um, creating their corpora and determining their headwords. Uh, some of them apparently have um, released the uh, headwords, but that's rather problematic for them because they do want to adjust the um, headwords at each level as um, their series evolves and so forth. So once they've released it, that sort of locks them into a specific um, set of headwords, which they might not want to do. Okay, thank you. And again, another question from Glenn. Um, does mReader have the ability to measure reading time? Um, no, it doesn't. Yeah, that would be very nice. But since mReader is only a quiz after students have read the book, the only way to measure the time is a questionnaire, which we do have. We do ask on a scale of one to five or six, uh, how long did it take you to read the book? And it, it's just in half hour increments. So we do have a rough measure, but nothing like X reading where you can see exactly how long it took a student to read the book. And you, in which case the quizzes really aren't important because you can see the student has read the book unless they have systematically set a timer and flip the page every 30 seconds. So yeah. And Glenn, you don't have to smile. I expected questions from you. <laughs> All right, um, so are there any other questions? If there are any other questions, you could probably put them in the chat. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes before we have to finish. Okay. I have an observation, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, yes, Rob. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that, I mean, I, I completely agree with Tom, what the point that he's making, that it's a very messy system, but I think we need to make a distinction between two types of leveling. One is the initial leveling of the library. We're talking about leveling a library. How do we build a library? And many of the scales that Tom has mentioned is all about how do we place books in our library? Where are the lower level books? Where are the middle level books? Where are the high level books? And that will be a rough process because every publisher does something different. But as library managers, we then need to make sure that the library is interactive. It's not fixed. So we need to get feedback from the students and get them to report to us in the early days of a library to say, I think this book's in the wrong place. If you get six or seven people say so, then you move it up and move it down. You can only level a library to the students that you have. So even though you might take the system from the publishers and build a library in Poland, the exact same system applied in in uh, China might not be appropriate. So no. we've got all kinds of levels. So the first stage is to actually build the library. The next stage is where the students have helped themselves will help to level the library. And hopefully with an interactive process, the library will be leveled to those students. Then it'll be mm -hmm. much, much easier for the no. students to go through and do their own individual leveling through the five finger rule. So I think we need yeah. to make that distinction between leveling and building a library and choosing a book for a student. If I could respond to that, yes, um, that's true. But it depends also on how big your library is. Uh, we have um, at Kyoto San Gyo decided that, oh, these books really should be at a different level. And then we have to go crawling into the library on our knees, basically, to ask librarians to take these 300 books and put different stickers on them. Another problem is that, that we do like to keep, for uh, the sake of simplicity, all books at one publisher's stated level at the same level in the library, whereas it would be better to take them and move them into separate levels depending on how we have measured the level or how students have reported the level, but that makes 
say, reshelving the books more difficult and other things. So if you have a small library, it's fine. You can just grab the books from here and put them over there. But uh, it doesn't work if you have a, an administration to go through. And yeah, so that, anyway, that's my response to that. Thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Glenn, for your, for your questions. Okay, so everyone, if you could um, unmute yourselves and give Tom a round of applause for his presentation, please.